Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here for our latest Tory talk from the Tory Botanical Society. Uh, my name is Catherine Mercier. I'm the programming chair for the Tory Botanical Society. Um, and I'm also working on my PhD at CUNY and work with New York City Parks. The Tory Botanical Society was founded in the 1860s by amateur botanists, students, and colleagues of Dr. John Tory, one of the most influential American botanists of the 19th century. Today, the objectives of the society are to promote interest in botany and to collect and disseminate information on all phases of plant science. To meet these objectives, the society um, has a couple of major activities, which include uh, meetings, field trips, uh, our journals, uh, funding graduate student research and education, as well as funding symposia, and of course, our Tory talks. The best way to stay updated on everything we're doing in the future is to check out the website, torybotanical.org, and all our social medias, which are up on the screen right now. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of the upcoming events. So at the end of this month, we have quite a few events uh, related to the City Nature Challenge. So check those out. And next month, uh, in May, we're also going to have a field trip from Dr. Harvey Ballard, who's also going to give our Tory talk for May. So keep a lookout for those. So tonight's talk will be presented by Dr. Frosty Levy, Professor Emeritus of Biology at East Tennessee State University, and also an editor for our journal um, of the Tory Botanical Society. Frosty earned his PhD at Duke University uh, before joining East Tennessee State. His research focuses on understanding the causes and patterns of diseases in natural plant populations. And before I give anything else away, I will hand it over to our speaker. Okay, first I wanna, I wanna express my appreciation to the society for inviting me, uh, in part because my roots are in New York in the Bronx, in fact. My grandfather would take us to the Bronx Zoo every weekend. Um, when I was a master's student at City College, I took a course at the Botanical Garden. Actually, it was a plant geography with Arthur Cronquist. We took a, at the end of the course, we took a 10-day trip down the mountains to Georgia, up the coast, back to New York, a couple of days changing laundry, and then seven days up the coast to Maine and down inland back to New York. It, I think that stimulated my interest in endemics, how they came to be, how you got these distribution patterns. And, and so we're going to talk about an area that has a good number of endemics. This is uh, a view of Rhone Mountain. The road, can you see my pointer? The, the yes, road? We can. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, the road over here uh, at the crest is the border. Tennessee is on the left and North Carolina is on the right. And this is the way Roan Mountain looks more recently where these natural balls that occur in the Southern Appalachians are being invaded somewhat by trees uh, and obviously climate change is thought to be one of the culprits. But my roots are here really. In fact, this is the Cross Bronx Expressway. Just to the right of that tunnel is where I lived in an apartment building when I was, after I was born. And they told us we needed to move because they're throwing down the building for the Cross Bronx Expressway. You see the exit sign is Jerome Avenue. We moved to Featherbed Lane and Jerome Avenue four blocks away. And some years later, you need to move because they're throwing down the building for the Cross Bronx Expressway. And my folks got tired of that, so they moved to Queens at that point. And I felt like we lived to move to the country because there were trees in the sidewalk in Queens. But this, this talk uh, takes place over here on the border of North Carolina and Tennessee, a close-up of topo map of that area. 
the Appalachian Trail follows the crest and the state line. And the weather can be brutal. Uh, the mountain gets over 6,000 feet. And the study site is along the Appalachian Trail, at least the study site for a good portion of this work. The mountain has been visited by most of the famous botanists historically from North American botany, at least in the Eastern United States, partly because of the, um, of all the endemics and for the disjuncts. This is one of the long distance disjuncts, this Pacera uh, species of the far north. This is Alnus viridis, another long distance disjunct found in very few sites further south. And then there's a whole suite of endemics, or at least a handful of endemics to this mountain and a few others. Uh, the Rhone Mountain Blue at Houstonia, Montana, it has the habit of a alpine cushion plant somewhat. Only found in that region. And then there's the federally endangered GM radiatum. Also state endangered, obviously. And here's the alder, the GM, and the Houstonia all together in that spot. So I gave you a little background on Rhone and its botanical significance. And the things we'll cover are the motivation for the study. The main study organism was a natural occurring lily, Gray's lily. And then we'll talk more about the different aspects of the epidemiology. Once we cover that, we'll see what we can find out about the prior history and about other populations and other native lilies. And in between, I'll try to put in some other interesting plant species along the way and try to keep some of the interest, in, interest with pretty pictures of interesting species. So part of my motivation was once a disease was noticed, at that point I had been working with human pathogens for about a dozen years, working on antibiotic resistance. And it seemed like a, a good point and a good place to get back into botany, which was, I, was something I was wanting to do for a while. And so this leaf spot disease of Gray's lily was noted for some time. This is a view of what we saw on the first slide. In the foreground are a couple of Gray's lily in the bald. The first student who worked on this was Joe Powell, 2010. And he's there on the top of the mountain. Let me tell you a little bit about Gray's lily first. It's got a, a bulb and so it's obviously a perennial. The bulb can make offshoots. Gray's lily is an endemic to mostly the higher elevations of the Southern Appalachians. And it has federal as well as state status. Usually occurs at higher elevations. And there it's found in the balls, which we spoke about. in some forested seep areas, boulder fields, and at lower elevations, occasionally found in boggy areas. It's an exceptionally photogenic species. Photographers come and they set up their tripods and set up, uh, in fact, they make informal paths to these beautiful gray's lily. Most of the botanists come at this time, and this is early summer, late June to early July. But if you come back a little bit later in the year, they look like this. And then if you come late summer, like this. And notice the background, most of the plants are green. 
This is not that the season ending because it's uh, a frost coming. This is early senescence of the plant. So the disease is a leaf spot disease. Usually they're not fatal. They cause these leaf spots. And what you're looking at is a leaf with several leaf spots. The whitish substance is the conidia, the asexual spores that are produced. And the main effect on Gray's lily is early senescence. The spots can be noted on the leaves, on the flowers, in different parts of the flowers, as well as on the fruit and capsules. The disease was noted in the 90s, and then some quantitative work was done, and it showed that this early senescence is widespread in the populations that were being looked at. So the hypothesis was that it's caused by a fungal infection, and therefore moist environments are probably detrimental. It was a problem that repeated year after year, and the hypothesized pathogen was a species of Calidotrichum, fungal pathogen. So fungicide treatments were tried, and that was not effective, and clear canopy clearing was really not effective either. And so now I want to speak a little more about what the causal organism is and some of its characteristics. So most of this work on pinning down the cause was done by the graduate student, Russell Ingram. And Russell's now the plant pathologist, PhD, uh, working for, for Bayer Chemical. The real pathogen is Pseudocircus spirella inconspicua. It has a sexual phase and an asexual. The sexual phase is sometimes referred to as microspherella martagonis, the martagonis named for the species of lily it was first isolated from, a Eurasian species. So in the initial survey, there was an association between showing the symptoms, the leaf spots, and having Pseudocircus spirella inconspicua, and looking like a healthy plant and lacking the pathogen. Pseudocircus spirella, was known to be a host in North America for Lilium canadense, Michiganensis, and Philadelphicum. It can be recognized by these unbranched conidia fours, the white structures that you see. This is one of R Russell's photos, as well as conidia morphology, size and shape of the conidia, the asexual spores. So, we were looking at the conidia and the conidia fours, but there's also a sexual stage where it can produce ascospores. And these spores can overwinter in the soil, in the leaf litter, and reinfect the next year. But if you remember, we're seeing senescence of the whole plant, not just uh, let me go backwards. Not just a, a, not a systemic effect. And so the question was, how come the whole plant is showing effects when it just causes leaf spots? This group of fungi that Pseudocircus spirella is in, it can produce a toxin, circosporin. It's like activated. And when it's activated, it can cause cell membranes, plant cell membranes to burst and then the fungal hyphae can uh, feast on the cell contents. So there is a mechanism for systemic effects. Russell, when he was trying to isolate the pathogen and come up with a pure culture that we could work with, he noticed that a lot of the media was turning a red color. And that's one of the diagnostic features of the circosporin. When fungi produce circosporin on certain culture media, that will turn the media red. And more recently, it was this toxin was isolated from a species of Pseudocircus spirella. 
So we had good reason to believe this was what was mediating the systemic effects. It was difficult to isolate to pure culture. So we did some roundabout ways to show that this really is the pathogen looking for an association. If the plant looks diseased, well, does it have the pathogen? And invariably, the answer was yes. If you're showing the typical symptoms, the pathogen was there, the Pseudocircus borella. Then we tried some field inoculations. And after inoculating plants in the field where we had permits to do this, this is what the control plants looked like. And the inoculation spot is right over here. We make a little abrasion on the leaf and touch some inoculum to that. And this is the experimental plants that had conidia as the inoculum, and they showed the leaf spot. And so it took a while to get this to pure culture to complete Koch's postulates, but eventually Russell did that. It actually he didn't really finish till after he graduated, but Koch's postulates, if you think a pathogen is causing a disease, you need to isolate it uh, into a pure culture, reinfect a naive organism, look for the same symptoms, and then re-isolate the pathogen. And once we had that pure culture and all of this pinned down, we were able to get DNA sequence. And our sequence is the one that's highlighted you can see it's most closely related to another Pseudocircus borella, as well as other circosporoid, uh, circosporin producing fungi, all of the ones that you see there. We looked at the spore load in the environment. And in general, if you had a high degree of spores, you were diseased. Other plants had generally, other species, no, none of the characteristic uh, spores or conidia, occasional stray ones. So there's not just millions and millions of spores flooding the environment. So once we felt we had the pathogen, we wanted to understand more about the patterns of the disease, where it occurs and if the occurrences are random year to year. And so we did some traditional demography, took measures on, on plant height and leaves and, and reproductive characters, but we added in measures of the disease. That was done with a, a traditional disease scale. You can think of it as healthy plants get a grade A, plants that are all senesced above ground, they get a grade F. It was a six point scale. And so here we are in, in blue, I have the Doe River highlighted and Roan Mountain and Carver's Gap are down here at the headwaters of the, of the uh, Doe River. Again, we're working in this area that's uh, on the balds. It was a 1800 meter transect from Jane Bald to Grassy Ridge. It's a close up of the area. Uh, my screen cuts off the top, so I can't see the very top. I'm just guessing what comes next. And so this, it was a multi year demography. I'm going to show a couple of years where uh, everything was similar from year to year. High, high above ground senescence, impacted the number of seed producers where they were very few. And many of the capsules had the symptoms of the leaf spot disease on them. And so we looked at the pattern of occurrence of this disease, thinking it may give us more insight into some of the disease mechanisms or the ecology of the disease. And so this is a diagram of the transect from Jane Bald on the left to Grassy Ridge on the right. The dotted line is the transect. Now that's 1800 meters. The, the y-axis is only five meters on either side of the, uh, of the transect. So it's greatly exaggerated. 
we use the scan statistic to look for clusters of individuals with disease. This is typically used, uh, typically used when you're looking for cancer clusters, or was used a lot in human disease or human epidemiology. In this case, when I show the next few slides, a red circle will mean all those individuals in the circle represent a significant cluster of diseased individuals, more diseased than the rest of the population. A green circle will rep represent a cluster of individuals who were healthier than other plants in the population. So now if we look at one year of data going from early July to early September, mid-September, the diagrams show that towards the Jane Bald or left side, there was a, a disease cluster and towards the red grass, grassy ridge end, there was a health cluster. This is the population mean, and you see it decreases over time. And you see the disease cluster was always worse than the mean, and the healthy cluster was always better. Now over here, you may wonder, well, what happened to the disease cluster? Well, what happened is the rest of the population caught up. And so it doesn't appear as a cluster anymore. So if we look at three years of data, what you note here is that the disease cluster tends to be on that side, the Jane Ball side. The health cluster seems to be uh, and stable over time. So then you may wonder, well, is it because that area just has better plants? It's a good environment. They're healthier plants. They're more vigorous and so on. So we use the same cluster analysis to look for clusters of any other characters that we measured. The morphological characters, the reproductive characters, and none of them showed any clustering. We used logistic uh, regression and similarly asking what best explains your disease status. And the only thing that was important was location on the transect. All the other morphological reproductive characters had no impact. So disease seemed to be independent of morphology or vigor. And let's look at some of the additional impacts of this disease. It causes fewer seeds per capsule. The capsule is way less and the individual seeds way less. So it's clearly impacting reproduction. In addition, just like those early observations in the 90s, seedlings and juveniles really get hammered. And they go out of the, uh, they senesce early summer. Once we felt we knew what was happening on Real Mountain, what's causing the disease, how it occurs, that it's a recurring problem, it causes reproductive problems. The next question was, is this a new pathogen? Is it new to the region? Is it emerging pathogen of Gray's lily? And to answer this question, we needed a historical record doing some forensic botany. And here, this is where herbarium specimens are exceptionally useful. Our herbarium has about 30,000 specimens, a handful are of the native lilies. So we went to some of the slightly larger herbaria and borrowed specimens. I mentioned that so many of the big names in American botany had been there. And this was looking at these specimens was like a who's who of American botany. They went back to the mid 1800s, uh, some of them from Roan Mountain. And so we got 75, not as many specimens as you would think for the number of visitors, 75 Gray's Lily. 
And we also looked at the closely related Lilium canadense, and we got hundreds of those. And so this is what we have. Canadense is divided into two varieties. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. And we see the different states and provinces where those specimens came from. Of the 51 from Maine, one had the leaf spots with the conidia, showing it was Pseudocircospirella inconspicua. One of the 25 canadense from Vermont, and one of the nine gray eyes from Tennessee. We then queried the fungal record, and not a whole lot of records, but the ones that we had were from generally the northern states and adjoining Canada. This a cultivated Lilium martagon. And if you were here, if we were in person, I'd pose a question to the audience and say, well, there was that one specimen of Gray's lily. And where do you guess it was from? And so that one specimen was from Roan Mountain. And then I'd ask, well, when would you guess it was collected? And there I expect maybe I'd get some wrong answers that you'd say 1990, but it was collected in 1947. So this disease has been around for a while. Obviously with a herbarium study, there's biases. And the most obvious one is people like to collect good looking specimens. But you don't always know that. You may have some people like me is you see an interesting disease on a leaf and well, let's get that plant. So you, you can't tell which direction the bias is gonna go. There's definitely seasonal bias, especially with these gray's lily. People wanna be there when they're flowering. And if you're there when they're flowering, you're missing the main disease season. And also with a specimen, you don't know how large the population size is. Although the anecdotal evidence is that the populations of Gray's lily on Rome are larger than they were historically. So at this point, Russell had graduated and, uh, and Joe Powell had been long gone. And it was time to took on another student and we started looking at other populations of Gray's lily. This is the natural range, uh, Southwest Virginia, Western North Carolina and Northeastern Tennessee. And so here's what we found without showing on any numbers. We already knew on Roan Mountain, there's disease. On adjoining Big Yellow Mountain, disease impacts. Grandfather Mountain, if you haven't been there, stupendous place to go. It's along the Blue Ridge Parkway, one of the higher mountains. And yes, there was disease there. In fact, Russell saw in the visitor center, they had a 10 by 10 foot picture photo of a gray's lily. And he told them, you know, that lily that you have, it got symptoms of leaf spot disease on it. Further south along the parkway is Craggy Gardens. And I understand that the Tory Club on the field trip they're taking, uh, the annual trip, I think you'll be going to Craggy Gardens. And I think uh, Gary Kaufman will be leading a walk there, Forest Service botanist. And he's very familiar with this disease. Uh, sure enough, yeah, on Craggy Gardens, the disease north in Bluff Mountain, more disease, and then into Virginia, White Top. And so disease was present throughout the range. And you're wondering, well, was it as bad as Roan Mountain? It wasn't just as bad. Roan Mountain had the healthiest plants. So this was devastating populations throughout the range. And then the next thing to do was ask, well, how, what is it doing to other native lilies? We had some informal ob observations already. And so we'll go back to the Doe River. And the Doe River has a series of lilies. There's Philadelphicum near the mouth, Lilium Mashoei, Lilium Superbum, 
at the Rhone, we already spoke about Gray's Lily. And then a little bit distant at a few other sites is Lilium canadense. So we'll look at some of these. And here's that, that diagram of the Doe River. We already been to Carver's Gap. We'll go towards the mouth in Hampton. I was recommended to go take a hike here and it's only 10, 15 minutes from uh, the house. So parked at the parking lot and this is what it looks like, little parking lot. It's a pine, white pine plantation, trees covered with exotics like Asian bittersweet, path lined with privet. And I, I just thought, how could he tell me there were good wildflowers here? But then we started walking and I've worked on phacelias most of my career and started seeing masses of phacelia bipinnatifida. And I thought, well, this could be interesting. And we got up to the top of the hill and dropped down the side and there was some Lilia philadelphicum. This is a endangered species only found in a few sites in the state. There were only a few plants, but they were disease free. You know, it's a very small sample size. Now I'm familiar with this. My wife, Elaine, she's from North Dakota. This is a, a grassland uh, sand hill area in North Dakota and it's common species there, but it's a rare species in our neck of the woods. This watershed site turned out to be fabulous. Uh, more southern, this is a disjunct of Circium caroliniana, because where the site is way up here. If you're familiar with the Katona dolomite glades in Alabama, Jim Allison discovered these about 20 years ago or so. One of the species there is this Rudbeckia triloba and a highly dissected leaf uh, for, uh, version of this, variety Pinataloba. I did a little window experiment and showed that plants from, uh, from that watershed, genetically they lobed. This is a rare species in the same site. And then just, some of these things that just knock you out if you're a botanist, the umbrella magnolia. It's at the mouth of this gorge. The Tweetsie Railroad ran through here. And as spectacular as a hike, I think, as you'll find anywhere in the United States, you're looking down into the gorge of the Godot River. Very few people here also. Okay, let's move up the river a little bit to Roan Mountain State Park. This is the Doe River going through the park. The park has a population of Facelia fimbriata. This is one of the low elevation, lower elevation sites for this species. It's a Blue Ridge species. And it has some very large populations of Lilium superbum. So we looked at Rhone and a few other mountains in the area. This was mid-season and they were declining except for Holston Mountain. By late season, same kind of impacts on Superbum that we're seeing on Gray Eye. We had high hopes for Holston Mountain because the plants looked really good there mid-season. By late season, they also were pretty much senesced. But the curious thing is, these are large populations, much larger than the gray's lily, hundreds of plants in some of these populations. You could have a, a whole group of senesced plants and sticking right out in the middle of those is a healthy survivor. And you have to think that that environment's not that different. The spores must be around and so, you have to wonder about resistance. And we haven't done that work. It's the work that really needs to be done, looking for genetic resistance. This is Cindy Barrett, who worked on, who did some of this work with the other species. Uh, this, is, this is how the superbums can look. But if you go later in the season, this is the way they look. 
So they're highly susceptible. Let's move to Lilium mashoei. This is also a species of the Blue Ridge. It has leaves with a thick cuticle. Populations are invariably small, so we had to go to a lot of sites and couldn't get lots of numbers. But at all of these sites, there was no evidence of disease. Late season, the plants looked just as good as they did early season. Lots of them making capsules, no evidence of leaf spots or senescence. And lastly, the last species is Canadense. Two sites where it occurs in our region. We'll first look at the Schoolyard Spring site. It's a nature conservancy preserve in the northeasternmost county in Tennessee. It's somewhat of a calcareous spring area, lots of interesting species. The only site for Stachys Appalachiana, a relatively recently described species, the only site for, uh, uh, for this Glyceria. And at Schoolyard Springs, not a large population, but they're all healthy. This is the way they looked flowering time, early July. And this is the way they looked mid-August. And this is the way they continue to look, and they made good capsules. No evidence of disease. Although we knew that Canadense is a potential host. And lastly, Elaine and I have been doing a plant survey at the Holston Munitions plant. This is where uh, they produce explosives for bombs. And so uh, my joke is that the, uh, the explosive business is booming. Uh, and so we were, we were allowed access to this site and access is highly controlled. You have to go through a checkpoint. Uh, civilian vehicles often aren't allowed in unless they're already pre-approved. But it's a fabulous site, 6,000 plus acres. That big ridge that you see is Bays Mountain. And it encompasses, the, the munitions plant encompasses seven miles of the Holston River. Uh, no boats are allowed in, so it's highly restricted. What you're looking at in the mid ground there is where the production area is, where the explosive is produced. More in the foreground, that funny pattern, those are storage bunkers. If you've watched X-Files ever, sci-fi show that was on 30 years ago, this is this kind of thing. It's, it's like you're in the weirdest kind of environment. These bunkers, they look like small Native American mounds and they're scattered throughout a forested area. They're covered in vegetation. They have roads that go by them and you'll be there and a big semi truck will pull up back up to a small door in this mound couple of people in white hazmat suits will get out and start unloading explosive for storage in these bunkers. Besides that, it has a fabulous flora here, including Phacelia uh, persei, the low elevation fringe Phacelia. But also over here in what are shale hills or knobby areas, there's a population of uh, of Lilium canadense. And the newest information, which was only two days old, uh, I was there on Sunday, and there's also a very nice population uh, over here where it's early season, so I don't have any data on that population. So let's look at the population where the red dot is. And over here, we've never seen them flower. We've been working in there for the last four years or so. Uh, 
they all sent us very early. Not allowed to take photos, no cameras allowed here, but we are allowed to collect herbarium specimens. And so this is one of the herbarium specimens, characteristic leaf spot with the canidia. And so what do we know now about Pseudocircus brella inconspicua? That's the original host from which it was described. In North America, it had this distribution that was known, but we now know it occurs in more Southern states, at least in the mountains. But we still have this nagging problem of, what is this with Michoei? where they're not getting disease. They look terrific, all the other native lilies are. And so we did some lab inoculations. And the way this worked was uh, these were done inside on either plants that were allowed to dig or on some plants that were grown from seeds. Inoculated different parts of the leaf using the same kind of inoculation that Russell had done years and years before. And we measured the lesion itself, the grayish brown area, as well as the chlorotic zone. And so this is measuring the chlorotic zone and comparing a proximal spot to a distal spot. And the result was that all three species get infected and the infection increases over time, the spot. This is looking whether you infect the upper versus the lower part of the leaf, and didn't matter, all get infected. This is using fungal hyphae versus conidia, all infected. And this is looking at the lesion area, hyphae versus conidia. One thing to note, is that the symbols, the LM are the triangles, and that's Lilium mishoei, the firm leaf species that we never saw infection in the field. And notice for all these measures, they're some of the most highly infected. So mishoei can show disease if you introduce it. So all the species we saw were infectable. And so now we know that these were the known hosts. We know gray eyes a host. We know superbum is a host. I don't know what you how you consider Mashoei. It's a potential host, but it's not infected in nature. So to sum up, we've identified the pathogen extended the host and geographic range, showed transmission routes, and showed some of the impacts on all life stages, as well as on reproduction and on recruitment, because these young plants are really getting knocked back. The disease occurs in stable clusters, stable over time, stable in space. With some of the escapees, especially on Roan Mountain, seeing that Grassy Ridge has an area of healthy plants, that makes you wonder, maybe it is environment and not genetic resistance. It's something we haven't done. But certainly we're looking at an epidemic in gray eye and at least regionally an ep epidemic in superbum. And so with Mishoei, we don't know. Maybe their populations are too far apart from the other species, and so the spores are not getting there. Mishoei likes drier sites. Most of the other, all the other species likes it, like it moister, except for Philadelphia. Um, but anyway, maybe they're too far. Spores aren't getting there. Maybe the environment's not suitable for the pathogen, but maybe that cuticle is an impermeable barrier that, uh, that the hyphae can't get through. We're seeing an epidemic. 
we know that the treatments, the potential treatment of fungicides and clearing canopies don't work. But there is some suggestion that there's genetic resistance. When you see in superbum, you see all these diseased individuals surrounded by a healthy. But even if you could treat the gray eyes, there's a reservoir in the more common, a more widespread and larger populations of superbum. Several students worked on this and I wanna thank them. Uh, we were given access and permits from, and help from a lot of different agencies. We appreciate all of those. Especially wanna thank my wife for helping with everything. She's a biologist also, honest. And Solly was with us all the time. He's been replaced and Delia's there now. Lastly, if you haven't been, this is Roan when Rhododendron catawbiense blooms. And people come from all over to see the Rhododendron blooms. Come to see Gray's Lily, at least early in the season. And I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that. Um, it looks like we already have a question. Amy, would you Is like it, to... Um, can I unshare? Yes. I'm not sure. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, Amy, if you want to ask your question, you can just go ahead. Okay. Um, so my question, you had these three potential explanations for why L... Mishoei wasn't getting infected in the field, and one of them was the cuticle forming a barrier, but wouldn't that have affected the inoculation experiments if the cuticle was really preventing infection? When, when, you, when you do an inoculation experimentally, you abrade the leaf a little bit with, okay. with your fingernail or with something, a scalpel, you know, okay. preferably something sterile, and that's that's typical. I'm not a plant pathologist, but that's typical for plant pathology. Thank you. And I'm completely jealous of those. I was a, a student in plant science between 1993 um, and 99. And the, those field trips with Cronquist were legendary. I was so jealous. Oh, were they? So uh, were you at the garden? Well, between Lehman and the garden. Yeah, I took some courses at Lehman also. I was at City College, but uh, uh, I took a course with Valdivinos and, oh, yeah. um, oh, I forgot his name, plant morphologist, anatomist. Dominic Basile. Yes, yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for your talk. Yeah, thank you for working at City College. <laughs> I'm a City College graduate twice. <laughs> I know, good for you. Uh, hi. Um, so um, first of all, I just want to say thank you uh, for all of your work. Um, I'm a graduate student at App State University uh, working on Gray's Lily. I love the species. I have paper mache Gray's Lilies here on my desk. Uh, and Russell's thesis and Cindy's thesis have just been, it, my work would not have been possible without uh, you and your students. So genuinely, thank you. Um, and so with that, uh, the, the hypothesis, or I guess the, the overwintering of fungal tissues in the dead leaf tissues uh, is really exciting. Because uh, I know in, in Russell's thing, thesis, it was, I guess, a hypothesis from like 1925 that they may be doing that. And so if I understand you correctly, in the sister species, the Pseudocircusparella capselli, it is confirmed that those fungal tissues are overwintering in like dead leaf tissue of Lilium. No, 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 um, no, two different things here, I think. Um, the, in general, these type of ascomycetes are thought to spread, rain splash can spread them. And so they're thought to overwinter on the soil surface. And so the two mechanisms of infection are thought to be as the plant emerges from the soil, it's picking up spores. And that may explain the pattern that we've seen where the lower leaves get infected first. 
Uh, and the other mechanism is raindrop splashes and and uh, and you know makes a, a a wind with the spores. But the senescence was a different aspect where generally leaf spot diseases are restricted. Just you have lesions on the leaf, but it doesn't kill the plant. And yet, you know, we're seeing at least the top is getting killed off. The, the root system doesn't necessarily die. And that's where we think the cercosporin is the culprit there. That toxin that many of the cercosporoid uh, microspherulaceae fungi produce. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess, um, you know, just because I've thought a lot about like how the fungus actually uh, persists in the environment, you know, and I know that uh, Russell worked on it and found that, you know, it seemed like it wasn't present in other species, or at least an absence to low amount of Pseudococcus borella in those kind of surrounding plants, uh, other lily or non lilium species. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I, I read that hypothesis that he wrote about and got really excited about it. And then um, it seemed like there, there was new information on that. But, but I've pulled up that uh, Swiderska Barek et al. 2020 paper. Uh, thank you for showing that to me. I will be reading it tonight. <laughs> and the other species that we looked at, those were in proximity. Uh, they were right in the same areas as the, uh, as the infected grazed lilies. Yeah, yeah, uh, but it was, it, you know, it's lilium specific, right? Those other, right. Species, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just, just thinking a lot about management and then how we are gonna manage for the disease. Um, yeah, and I'm aware of the, that you've been working on them. Yeah, um, yeah, so so we've been doing the genetics, right? Um, I've been doing population genetic diversity, so I haven't been looking at resistance specifically. Um, Look at resistance, that's what we need. I, uh, well, I have a big demographic data set and a genetic data set. <laughs> Submitted my thesis yesterday, uh, and now the next step is analyzing those in concert. So, hoping to uh, uh, find something interesting to contribute yeah. to the cause. Yeah, send me your thesis. I, if you want it, I'll send it to you right now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thanks. Thank you. All right. It looks like we have a question from Jordan in the chat. I'm just asking if he would like to read it. Hello. Hi, Frosty. Hey. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, I, I do have a question for you. I <clears throat> so I I really found the uh, I'm sorry, I think my mic is going crazy right now, but but uh, I really found the uh, part of your talk where you you kind of explored uh, the impact of of like researcher collection preference on on like how long it took us to even realize that this uh, this disease was was around. Um, and affecting these these plants, uh, I found this to be very interesting. And I was wondering uh, what you thought about uh, you know how pervasive a problem this is, like of of researchers kind of looking for like really immaculate plants and therefore missing uh, uh, you know like potential important fungal pathogens. There's a good number of papers, and I forget the name of the person who does a lot of work on that. If if I can remember who it is or find the reference, uh, I'll send it to you, but but it's it's a known problem. And, and when we submitted a manuscript on that, uh, one of the comments was that, uh, well, obviously there's collection bias, but you can't predict what direction it's gonna go in the collection bias. And so it, it creates an unknown problem that you hope randomizes, but probably doesn't. And it's all that we have. We don't have any other historical record. So all you can do is acknowledge it and, and say, well, we know the disease has been on Roan Mountain at least since 1947. May have been earlier. We don't know. Out of curiosity, do you think that uh, a species, the species like these lilies that you, I, if I recall, you said, <clears throat> that some of them might be um, like they aren't very common at the site. So the populations at a particular site are maybe like, you know, kind of small or a little scarce. You only find a few of them flowering at one time. Um, do you think that that might uh, like like potentially impact uh, 
like the like the collections where we're like maybe this group is perhaps more prone to be found uh, like these fungal pathogens that are developing because there's like less choice that that like botanists have for like collections they show up at a site and it's like well i collect this this flower that has like a you know a mark on it um like there's clearly like some sort of infection going on uh and i collect it or i go home with nothing well i think i think that's uh being very kind to collectors because often they're accused of taking the last of everything but uh <laughs> but the small population is true for Philadelphicum in our region, but Superbum can have immense populations, hundreds and hundreds of plants that go on for uh, hundreds of meters, maybe, maybe not hundreds of meters, but 100 meters of population. And, and that's why I think it's, it's a potential reservoir for these other species. Uh, Gray's lily, at least in current times, at least and on Rhone, it's common. And also at, at many of the sites it occurs at, there are a lot of plants in somewhat of a small area. And and um, and Ben may be able to speak more on that. But uh, the Mashoe eye, it's correct what you're saying that they always occur in small populations. Now, as far as the collectors, I've seen both kinds. Some of my favorite people in the world, one of my favorite people in the in the world who's not with us anymore, uh, I asked him, why are you collecting that? There was only one. And he said, yeah, that's why I got it. <laughs> and then and then I've seen other cases where, you know, well, there's not enough to collect, even though it would make a good, interesting specimen. Yeah, there really are like uh, different, <laughs> quite a, quite a diversity in in sort of collection tactics among mm -hmm. among uh, botanists, aren't there? Um, it's interesting to hear you say that. Uh, thank you. Appreciate your answer to my question. Thank you. Oh my gosh, so sorry. I don't know if you my dog. Um, are were there any other questions? I'll take this time to say uh, say hi and thanks to Adam McCullough and Stacy Bennett. Ben, if you want to go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm so, uh, greedy is to ask one more. Um, those Lilium canadensi populations at the, the Holston Munitions Base that are showing signs of disease, how late into the season are they kind of fully senescing or kind of that, you know, wilting state? before they even have flower buds. Wow. Okay. And, the re and I'm calling them Canadensi. It's possible they're Michiganensis, Ooh. but I think they're Canadensi. But okay. either way, either way, now, back on, on Sunday when I was over there, boy, the plants looked terrific, and there were dozens and dozens of them just coming up, you know, the, uh, there are a few of them with this tall putting out the first whorl and the second whorl of leaves. But uh, the pattern for that other population has been well, you go back in another month and they don't look, there. and then you go back when you would hope they're flowering and you can't even find them. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, those hybrid populations in southwestern Virginia seem to have much greater disease resistance and so that certainly mm. lined up with that shady school population so it's mm. wild to hear about uh one of candidates are getting blasted by the disease mm -hmm. oh thank you What were you saying, Frosty, before I interrupted? Oh, I just, I just got in a hello <laughs> to a former students, Adam McCullough and oh. Stacy Bennett. Adam helped with helped Russell with some of this work when Adam was an undergrad. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. Thank um, you. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, round of applause or Zoom applause. <laughs> All right, everybody have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.